Good morning, everyone. Let me once again bid you a warm welcome to our online service here in Glenwary Presbyterian Church on Sunday, the 21st of February. Whether you're connected to your own congregation here in Glenwary or just tuning in to worship with us today, you are more than welcome. We do trust that the Lord will continue to bless you and you will know his favour in these days as we wait in his strength. A couple of announcements today, once again, with regards to a midweek Bible study and prayer time. Uh, the teaching from Psalm 23 will again be uploaded to our uh, YouTube channel uh, with a link via our Facebook page in the middle of the week. This week, we can come to the conclusion of Psalm 23. We'll be, we will be considering verse 6. And then again at 8 p.m. on Wednesday evening, the 24th of February, we have our prayer meeting via Zoom. Uh, any details about that can be obtained either from myself or our elders or one of our committee members if you would like to join with us. Those are all our announcements. We continue our series entitled Solace in the Psalms today. Today's theme is, is waiting. And once again, as the news of lockdown being increased for another six weeks, we are waiting before we can come back to the house of the Lord to worship together. But the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 and in verse 31 writes these words, words of encouragement for God's people. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We can do that because we serve and we worship a truly faithful God. Our opening praise is uh, in the modern piece entitled What a Faithful God and Grace and Abby Smith are going to lead us in praise. What a faithful God.
Thank you, Grace and Abby, for those lovely words. What a faithful God. Let's turn to this faithful God now in prayer because we know that he is the God who not only hears but answers our prayers. Let's pray together. The prophet Jeremiah writes in Lamentations, This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father God, we bow in your presence in this your day. And we indeed acknowledge that you truly are the the faithful God. You are the unchanging God, the one who is unchanging in his being, substance and power. Father, you continue to pour out your grace upon grace on your people. You're the God whose mercy knows no limits. You're the one whom we can come to and we can find rest because you promise to cover your people with your pinions and under your wings we can find refuge. Your faithfulness is our shield and our buckler. Sovereign God, as we draw into your presence once again today to worship you, we thank you that not only are you a faithful God and a God of grace and mercy, but you're a God who who grants peace and comfort to your people such as your love for us. And Lord, we ask indeed at the beginning of this service that you would grant us that peace that passes all understanding, that we would know your power and your presence and your Holy Spirit would be poured out even in our living rooms as we listen online and as we praise you on this your day. Lord, we thank you truly that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. We shall mount up with wings like eagles. We shall run and not be weary walk and not faint because you are a faithful God but father we confess once again that we at times lack faith many times during this pandemic we have doubted your ways and your wills we have questioned you we have wondered the whys and wherefores of it all and lord in a sense when we question you we question your sovereignty forgive us for our doubts forgive us for those times when we fear Forgive us for those times when we fail to trust you as we ought to trust you. Have mercy upon us, Lord, for the times when perhaps lockdown has caused us to be more quick-tempered and impatient with with those whom we love because we all seem to be imprisoned in the the one house, unable to to socialize and meet with others. Father, cleanse us afresh this morning in the blood of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who was slain for us all alone on that center cross of Calvary. We thank that you are a faithful God and in your faithfulness you promise to cleanse and forgive those who are truly penitent. And so we claim that promise once again today that we might worship you in spirit and in truth that you may be pleased with our worship. Father, move amongst us, encourage the saints, rebuke those who as yet don't know you, even save souls in these days through online ministry. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today is from Psalm 130. Psalm 130, if you do have your Bibles with you, uh, please, in your own rooms, uh, open them up uh, and follow with me. If not, just press pause and go and get the Bible and follow along with us as you watch online. Psalm 130, let us hear the infallible word of God. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than the watchmen for the morning. O Israel, Hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen. And we trust the Lord will bless his word to our hearts here today. Well, boys and girls, I hope you all have been keeping safe and well uh, in recent weeks. And I do hope you have enjoyed your midterm break from Google Classroom. 
I know midterm has been different this year. You maybe haven't been able to go out and play with your friends. But it's nice just to get a rest, isn't it? From having to go online and do all that work that teachers are setting at the moment. And just chill out. You know, whenever I'm on holiday, one of the things that I like to do, boys and girls, to chill out is to read. I love reading. And I know some of you listening today, you love reading too. I wonder if any of the smaller boys and girls ever read any of the Dr. Seuss books. Have you ever read any of the Dr. Seuss books? Well, when Zara and Ella, my two girls, were young, their favorite was the cat in the hat. They loved Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat. And they also loved another one called Horton, Who Hears a Who. But do you want to guess what my favorite Dr. Seuss book is? Well, it's this. Oh, the places you'll go. Have you ever read it? Have you ever heard of it? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Well, well, Dr. Seuss's book, Oh, the Places You Go, is a guide to the journey of life. It's a book full of illustrations and full of rhymes. And it reminds us that we can be whatever we want to be, boys and girls, whenever we work hard and we put in some effort. It's a book that's fairly positive about all the places we can go in life whenever we try our best. But there is a little section right in the middle of the book. It's when the Dr. Zeus talks about a place he calls the waiting place. And he portrays the waiting place as being a useless place where all people do are waiting. The the book says they're waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow. And this is pretty much what all of life is like after you graduate from college. Everyone just waiting. You know, someone has estimated that if a person lives until they're 70, they will spend three years of their lives waiting in queues. That's a lot of waiting, isn't it? Three years out of 70. I wonder, do you like waiting, boys and girls? I must be honest, I do not like waiting. But the problem is this, even though we don't like waiting, there's nothing we can do to avoid it. We all have to spend some time in the place that Dr. Seuss writes about in his book called The Waiting Place. Right now, because of lockdown, we have to wait, don't we? We have to wait until it's safe to get back to school and see your friends again, and we don't like it. And maybe like Dr. Seuss, we think it's useless, but actually... The waiting place can be a very good place if we make good use of our time. We can use the waiting place to to read good books, maybe to to phone our friends, to go outside to play with our our family members, or, or even do some extra homework or study for the tests we get at school. So the waiting place can be a good place if we use it properly. And this morning, Psalm, boys and girls, we read about the psalmist, and he's in the waiting place. He writes in Psalm 130 in verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. Now, we don't know exactly what's going on in the psalmist's life at the time whenever he writes these words about the waiting place. It seems, we'll look at this later on with the big people, that he has sinned against God and he's aware of his sin and he feels sorry for displeasing God and so he cries out to God and asks him to forgive us for his sins and he waits in the Lord. Waiting for the Lord, for the psalmist, is a good thing because it draws him closer to the Saviour. Boys and girls, I know at times, just like the psalmist, we all sin. We all think and say and do things that that break God's law. But just like the psalmist, we have a God who is a God of mercy, a God of compassion, a God who is faithful. And if we love Jesus as our special friend, we can tell him we're sorry for our sins and we can wait and God will forgive us. You see, the psalmist tells us again today there that with the Lord there is forgiveness. Maybe over this past week you've had bad thoughts about the work the teacher is going to set online. Maybe you have said nasty things to your brother or sister. Maybe you have disobeyed mummy or daddy and you feel sad because you know that even even doing that makes God feel sad. Just like the psalmist, you can ask him to forgive you and wait upon the Lord 
and he will forgive you. The psalmist says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word, I do hope. Waiting is unpleasant, yes, but even as we wait, even during lockdown, it can be a good place if we use our time wisely. Maybe some of you after this afternoon will go and try and find that Dr. Seuss book that I referred to at the beginning of this service. It, it's at the beginning of this little talk. It's good sometimes to read books like that. But can I encourage you also during lockdown to read another book? Use your time wisely to read the best book, which is the Bible. The wee chorus says the best book to read is the Bible. The best book to read is the Bible. If you read it every day, it will help you on your way. The best book to read is the Bible. Boys and girls, in the waiting place, we can put our hope in the Lord. We can read his book, the best book, the Bible. And in it, we can find many promises that will encourage us in these days of waiting. Let's just come to the Lord now in prayer. Let us pray together. Father God, we bow in your presence today. And we acknowledge indeed that we are not good at waiting. We are by nature very impatient. But Father, we want to pray especially for the boys and girls in P1 and P3. We thank you that they're able to go back to school now on the 8th of March. And for the bigger boys and girls in year 12 and year 14, that they can go back to school on the 22nd of March. And Lord, we just pray that you would give them a sense of your peace and comfort as they wait for those dates. But we pray for all of our children today, Lord. Those who might have to wait until after Easter before they can return to school. Even teachers, Lord, who want to get back to school. Lord, we pray for them that as they wait, they will put their hope in your word. Lord, all of us are waiting for a way out of lockdown. Waiting for this roadmap to be published. As we wait, help us to trust in your sovereignty and in your perfect timing in it all. We do pray particularly once again today for wisdom to be granted to the Northern Ireland executive as they meet over the next week to to plot that, to plan that road out of lockdown. We pray that you would grant them wisdom beyond themselves to balance the needs of of health and the economy and and the mental well-being of the rest of society. Father, be with them and guide them and grant them wisdom from yourself. We pray for others who are waiting at this time for surgery or for treatment that has been postponed over this past few months. Many of them are anxious and are concerned, but we pray, Lord God, that soon that treatment will be able to be resumed. We pray in these days of time also, Lord, for that that waiting to receive what will happen with regards to this new private members bill that has been proposed by Paul Gervin against the, just that, that awful law of abortion in our land. Lord, we pray against all those laws with regards to abortion. We pray for the protection of the unborn child and the women. We pray for that whole law to be repealed. But in the meantime, Lord, step by step, we pray for this private member's bill, that that will see that those so-called disabled children, Lord, we have have minor issues in the whim, that they will be allowed to survive. Lord, move in the hearts and minds of our politicians, those who will vote. Help them to see right from wrong. Help them to make proper decisions to this end. And we pray indeed that you would return our nation back to the path of righteousness in these days. We also pray in these days, Lord, for souls to be saved. Lord, many were fearful perhaps a year ago whenever they heard of COVID-19 and now many are flippant. Lord, we pray that such people, you would grant them a, a holy fear of yourself. That they will realize that that even if COVID comes to an end one day, one day their life will come to an end. And they need to prepare to meet their God. Lord, we ask that you would save people for your name's sake in these days. Do continue to be with our elderly people. Those who are sick, those who are vulnerable, those who are lonely. We pray especially, Lord, for George Crothers and his family circle who, in the loss of George's brother-in-law recently, We pray, Lord, that you would draw alongside these people, that you would grant them peace and comfort in the midst of their time of loss. And Father God, now as we come to open up your word, we ask for the anointing of your spirit upon the preaching of your word. We pray that you would help both the the, the preacher and the congregation to not only to hear your word, but to apply it to all of our lives by faith. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Psalm 130. It's uh, another psalm in the collection of psalms which is commonly known as the Songs of Ascent. Last week we noted that these psalms were sung by the Old Testament pilgrims, pilgrims as they journeyed towards the city of Jerusalem on their way to worship the Lord in the Holy Temple. This psalm, I believe, would have encouraged pilgrims, pilgrims on their journey. It would have encouraged them to cry out to the Lord in, in prayers of confession as they made their way to the temple to worship God. This is because God's faithful people will always desire to worship the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart. God's people know their God as a God of mercy and a God of compassion. And so this psalm would have encouraged faithful Old Testament pilgrims to wait upon the Lord as they pray to him for mercy. And once they were assured of God's mercy, then they could have worshipped freely in the beauty of the temple. But how does this psalm apply to believers today? Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we travel towards the New Jerusalem, as we travel on route to, to glory, we will meet obstacles, bumps along the way. Like the psalmist, we will sometimes find ourselves in the depths of despair, often as a result of our own shortcomings, often as a result of our sinfulness, and therefore we will frequently have reason to pause, to confess our sins, to restore that, that, that union, that, that communion, that fellowship with the Lord. On route to glory. And as we do so we can hope on the Lord. We can hope on his word for mercy. And for grace along the way. Our sermon title is a call. To wait for the Lord. And yes with regards to lockdown. We do need to wait for the Lord in his time. But we need to wait on him. At all times. The psalm, I believe here, naturally divides into four parts. We're going to consider each one of them in turn. It begins there in the opening two verses with a cry. The psalmist's cry for mercy. Then in verses 3 and 4, we're reminded of the compassionate nature of God. And then in verses 5 and 6, we read of the psalmist's confident wait on the Lord. Before finally, in the final two verses, he commands others to put their hope in the Lord. So let's begin, friends, today by firstly considering the opening couple of verses there, the psalmist's cry for mercy. You may have noticed how this psalm begins in a very somber tone. The psalmist is low. He's downcast. He's in despair. Verse 1, he writes, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. You may be aware that the depths usually silence all that they engulf. But they cannot close the mouth of God's faithful servant here. On the contrary, it's in the depths, in the abyss, that he cries to the Lord. Charles Haddon Spurgeon in his commentary has written that prayer is never more real than when it rises out of the worst places. Spurgeon says the depths of earnestness are stirred by depths of tribulation. And that diamonds sparkle most amidst the darkness. You know, unfortunately, sometimes the depths of despair can, can cause us to feel isolated from God. Sometimes as we go through dark times in our lives, we can even be, re, be, be tempted to retreat and to run away from God. But it's sure, surely, friends, it's during the times of darkness that we need our God more than ever. Spurgeon encouragingly remarks that he that cries out of the depths shall soon sing in the heights. He that cries out from the depths so shall soon sing in the heights. I believe an excellent example of this can be found in the 17th century during the Thirty Years' War. A German pastor, Paul Garrett, and his family, they were forced to flee from their home. One night, as the family stayed and took refuge in a small village in, they were hopeless, sorry, they were homeless and they were afraid. The pastor's wife began to break down. She cried openly. In despair. To comfort his wife, Pastor Jared reminded her of the scripture and the promises about God's keeping power and God's provision for the saints. And then the pastor went out into the garden to be alone with God. He also broke down and began to weep. He felt as if his darkest hour had come and he cried out to the Lord in prayer. Soon afterwards, a, a remarkable thing happened. Jared began to, to feel his burden lifted and he sensed the presence of God afresh. 
He took his pen and he wrote a hymn, which John Wesley would later translate. That hymn has brought great comfort to many over the years. It's found in our Presbyterian hymn book, number 547. One of the verses says this, Give to the winds thy fears, hope, and be undismayed. God hears thy sighs and counts thy tears. God shall lift up thy head. Through waves and clouds and storms, he gently clears the way. Wait thou his time, so shall this night soon end in joyous day. Often, friends, it's in the darkest time that God makes his presence very real to us. And as we wait upon his time, the night often turns to joyous day. Maybe you're listening in today and you're currently feeling in the depths of despair. Maybe news this week that lockdown has been extended to the 1st of April. Or perhaps other personal trials, other issues in your life are causing you to, to despair at this time. If that's the case, can I encourage you today to take heart. Just like the psalmist, if you belong to Jesus, if you're a child of God, you can put yourself in his hands. You can cry out to the Lord from the depths and wait upon the Lord for his timing and he will give you a song in the night. But what is causing the psalmist to spare here in this psalm? Well, as we read into verse 2, we see it isn't necessarily, necessarily external circumstances, but rather it's internal turmoil. The psalmist is in deep despair here, friends, over his own sin. He says there, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. The psalmist's cry here is a beggar's plea. He's begging the great king and Lord to, to lend an ear to his cry. He doesn't articulate the precise nature of his sin. We can't be sure what specific sin he's seeking mercy for here, but his sin sorely afflicts his soul. He's in torment in the depths of despair because of his own sin. Are you aware, dear friends, that that's a good place to be in? The reality is it's only whenever people despair, it's only whenever we agonize over our sin, that we will ever even think of fleeing to the Lord for mercy. So can I ask you today, have you ever felt in the depths of despair because of your sin? Have, has God, the Holy Spirit, ever convicted you over the ugliness of, of your sin? And have you ever despaired and cried out to him for mercy like the psalmist? Oh, I trust you have. And if, if not, I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will open the eyes of your heart to see even today the darkness and the danger of unconfessed sin. You see, dear friends, the Bible teaches us that, that unconfessed sin separates us from God. Unconfessed sin, if not dealt with, not only separates us from God in this world, but it will separate us from God for all eternity. The prophet Habakkuk writes in, in, in Habakkuk chapter 1 and 13 that, that God is of pure eyes and he cannot see evil. He cannot look at wrong. Maybe you're listening in here today and you need to cry out to the Lord, perhaps even for the first time, for mercy, for the forgiveness of sin in your life. But maybe you're listening in today and you're our Christian. Brothers and sisters in Christ, can I remind you this cry is a cry that, that pilgrims of Christ, of Christ, we must cry out daily on our journey to the New Jerusalem. You see, it's a good thing for Christians to spend time each day with God confessing those ongoing sins that plague us. We ought to daily confess our sins to the Lord to receive his limitless mercy and grace. You see, although we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, we continue to mess up, don't we, brothers and sisters in Christ? We continue to fall into sin daily. John writes in 1 John 1 and 8 that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But you know, the important thing is this. Whenever the Christian falls, how does he react? I think of the example of the long-distant runner. He has this desire to reach the finish line that he can claim the prize and, and win the gold medal at the Olympic Games. That, that long distance runner, that Olympic athlete, he'll not be put off by one or two slips along the way. He, he, if he falls, he'll get up and he'll keep going again. The same thing applies to our Christian pilgrimage, friends. 
en route to glory. Yes, we will fall into sin, but like the psalmist, we need to be earnest. We need to get into the place of prayer. We need to gain the ear of God and seek his mercy afresh. Failure to see that important need in our life stunts our, our spiritual progress on our journey home. So the first thing we see in this psalm is this cry for mercy. But note secondly and very encouragingly where the psalmist cry is directed. The psalmist cry is directed towards the compassionate God. The compassionate God. Verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. You know, as an ex-school teacher, I know that every good school teacher will regularly mark their students' work. A good school teacher will keep comprehensive records of their performance, both in the class tests and in ongoing assessment tasks. That will help track and monitor the progress of the pupil and to plan future lessons. I'm sure you've heard on the TV screens recently that the recording of marks this year will be more important than ever for our GCSE and our A-level cohorts. Due to COVID-19, the Department of Education has decided that the grades awarded will be based entirely upon teacher assessment, teacher marks. In verses 3 and 4 here of Psalm 130, we read that, yes, the all-seeing God, he does keep a mark, a record of our iniquities, but praise be to God, he does not act upon that record for now. Instead, he lays it aside for another day until the final day of judgment. Oh, dear friends, if the Lord should call us to account for our lack of conformity to, to righteousness, where would any one of us be? In the psalmist we see here in this psalm, he's under conviction of his own sin. In a sense, he's struck by the holiness of God, so he confesses his sin. He knows that no one can stand before God, hoping somehow that their work will, will achieve a good enough grade to avert the wrath and the judgment of God falling upon them. In the words of the Apostle Paul, he is aware that none is righteous. No, not one. Friends, I hope you understand if it were not for the Lord Jesus Christ, if it were not for the work that he accomplished on the cross of Calvary for sinners such as me, you and me, whenever he died there alone, whenever he allowed his precious blood to be shed on the cross, none of us could ever hope to stand before God in the day of judgment. But the God that we worship is a compassionate God. Verse 4 assures us, with you there is forgiveness. Praise be to God. And so therefore, when we humble ourselves, whenever we confess our sins to this compassionate God, this merciful God, what does he do? Well, he transfers his son's perfect record, his perfect mark, his perfect score of righteousness to our account. This God looks at us as if we have never sinned, friends. Such is his mercy. If we trust completely in Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. We might compare God's mercy to a GCSE or an A-level student. Who in August receives a grade in the post that you don't merit. But they get it nonetheless. Why? Because someone else's perfect work has been credited to them. Can I ask you today, have you received Christ's record as your record? Have you received his perfect record of righteousness by repenting of sin and by trusting in what he did for you all alone on the cross of Calvary? If not, I plead with you today so that you will be able to stand before God on that day of judgment. If you desire to reach the new Jerusalem, if you desire ever to be in the glories of heaven, you need the perfect mark, the righteousness of Christ applied to your account to blot out your imperfect record. You see, dear friends, even for Christians, there are times whenever we fall into sin. And yes, I've been thinking this week about lockdown and, and how sometimes there's more tension and stress in the home because of it. Maybe there's more doubt about God's keeping power to get us through it. Maybe that we're becoming more agitated or quick-tempered with our loved ones than before. Or maybe we've engaged in some form of sin we never have been, been, been succumbed to before. The good news, if that happens, is that God is still that God of compassion and mercy. Prophet Micah writes about this in Micah 7 and verse 18. Micah 7, verses 18 and 19, we read these words. 
Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Maybe there is one listening online today. He is not yet saved. You need to come clean with God for the first time. Maybe there's a brother and sister in Christ and you've been doubting God or you've been falling into sin thinking no one sees it. Remember, the Lord sees it. The Lord knows it even during lockdown. Maybe you need to come and confess that sin that you know is proving an, ob proving an obstacle between your relationship with your God en route to glory. The cry for mercy. The compassionate nature of the God whom we can cry to. Thirdly, we see here the confident weight the confident wait, verses 5 and 6. I'm sure you may have heard about the, the man who, who prayed for patience and said, Lord, grant me patience, but grant it to me now. You know, at times we're all just like that, aren't we? Our impatient human natures mean that we want God to intervene in the various situations that we find ourselves in today rather than waiting on him. Of course, we can all relate to that with regards to the pandemic. We all long to return to, to normality. But Christian friends, we can wait in God's time for his will to be done. Verses 5 and 6 here of Psalm 130, we see a godly attitude, which we would all do well to cultivate in our lives. Verse 5, the psalmist affirms, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. What tremendous faith he has here. Having confessed his sin to God, he waits wholeheartedly for the Lord to respond in abundant mercy. His soul waits for the Lord. You know, often whenever we cry to God for mercy, it seems as if God is slow to answer our prayers, isn't it? But sometimes in the waiting place, the Dr. Seuss says is useful, useless. The waiting place can become a very useful place for the people of God. Because it's in the waiting place that often God wants to teach us great lessons, brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants to, to try our faith. He often wants to exercise our patience. He wants to train our submission. And he wants to make the blessing appear even more pleasant when it comes. The psalmist has a confident wait here in the Lord. And notice as he waits, where does he put his hope? Verse 5 says, in his word. I hope in his word. You see, the psalmist knows that God's word is totally dependent. He knows that, that God is the one who will never leave him nor forsake him. He knows that he can put his hope in his God and in the Bible throughout all the journeys of life, all the ups and downs, even in those times when he feels in despair because of his own sin. Friends, can I ask you today, are you waiting confidently in the Lord? Yes, your patience perhaps has been stretched at the moment. But are you hoping in his word in these days? To wait well, the Christian will wait well by studying the word of God daily. We will read this word. We will believe this word. We will hope in this word. We will live out this word. Can I ask you, are you waiting well? Our call to worship encouraged us there in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. The prophet there reminds us that they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The psalmist here confidently waits on the Lord. Verse 6, he says he's waiting more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. The, the watchmen that refers to those weary watchmen who, who kept watch at the city gates of Jerusalem. And of course, they, they long for that tedious night watch to be over. And that's what the psalmist is comparing his wait for the Lord to come and to restore him once again. He's so confident that it will happen. His cry for mercy, his compassionate God, his, his confident wit. Fourthly and finally, look how the psalm concludes with the command for others to hope in his God. O Israel, he says, hope in the Lord. Why? For with the Lord there is steadfast love. With him there is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. 
The psalmist here totally understands that the ideal Israel is where every single member will acknowledge their dependence upon the Lord, his mercy and his grace. This command to Old Testament Israel, friends, to hope in the Lord is a command to to New Testament Israel, to Christians today who form the New Testament Israel. We have been commanded here to put our hope in the Lord. Are you putting your hope in the Lord in these days of time? Why should we do so? Well, why should we hope in the Lord? Well, it says there with the Lord, there's steadfast love. He loves us with an incomparable love. There's plentiful redemption. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103, verses 3 and 5, that that the one in whom we should hope forgives all our iniquity. He heals all our diseases. He redeems our life from the pit. He crowns us with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies us with good so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord God, friends, through his son, Jesus Christ, can provide full redemption for his people. That means he can rescue us. He will rescue us. He will protect us from all of our troubles, including the trouble of sin, because with the Lord there's forgiveness of sin. We can hope in him both for today and for tomorrow. You see, this is because of the blood of Christ flowed freely for for sinners like you and me on the cross of Calvary. The blood of Jesus Christ has the power to redeem us, to buy us back from all of our iniquities, past, present, and future tense. What a blessing this is to know for the children of God. The hymn writer put it so well whenever he penned those words, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Can I ask you, are you wholly leaning on Jesus' name? Are you placing your hope on the, on the blood of Jesus and the, his righteousness that has been transferred into your account? Are you trusting in that one who died all alone for you on the cross of Calvary? If you are, then you can wait for the Lord. This is God's word to you today, brothers and sisters in Christ. In these days of isolation and caution, we can wait for the Lord, both to forgive us our sins and to help us through these difficult days. You see, forgiveness, hope, steadfast love, plentiful redemption, bountiful mercy is assured here for all who hope in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we do give you thanks once again for your word, for the comfort that we find therein. Father, we do confess that we're not good at waiting. Father, we thank you, however, that you're a God of patience, you're a God of mercy, you're a God of grace. And we do pray especially for those who are struggling during lockdown. Lord, perhaps they are, they, they are beset with un, unknown sins heretofore. We pray indeed that you would grant them the humility that they need to cry unto you for mercy, knowing that you are a compassionate God, knowing that they can confidently wait on you. And Father, we do pray for any who do not know you, that even in a time such as this, they would look to Christ. They would see that what he did for them on the cross of Calvary is the means through which we might come to know you, both for time and for eternity, and have that friend that sticks closer than a brother through the good and through the bad. Father, use your word to encourage your saints. Use it by your Holy Spirit to rebuke us, to to, to indeed Draw sinners to the throne of grace. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Our closing item of praise now is a piece entitled All Alone. And Grace is going to again lead us in this item of praise. All Alone reminds us about Jesus at Gethsemane.
And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each and every one of us this day and forevermore. Amen.